Hello, Casey Flett. Hey, how you doing? Pretty well, how are you? Not too bad, thank you, not too bad. So today we're going to talk about being a trans writer. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to do that. That, uh, that sounds great. It's a very passionate topic of mine. Wonderful. So you've been a published trans writer for over a decade now. How have you seen trans literature change over the last 10 years? You know, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, you know, it is sort of a, a, a well-known fact, maybe not as well-known as it should be, but, uh, you know, to us at least, um, there was a long time when, uh, you know, trans writers weren't really getting their, getting books put out. Um, there have always been, of course, trans people making art, and there have always been uh, trans people making writing and making books, but getting them published in the, uh, you know, in the conventional industry, that's, that's, that hasn't been something we've uh, traditionally had access to. Um, it's generally been memoirs for decades and decades. That was kind of the one way to, to get a book published, was to uh, write sort of a tell-all. Uh, so certainly fiction and poetry, though once again, trans writers have been writing that for, for decades. Um, it's really only recently, I would say, actually, in the last maybe even less than a decade, that we're starting to see, um, see uh, books like that get published. And certainly it's only been extremely recently that we've seen them get published by big presses. So for example, uh, Gene Thornton's Summer Fun, uh, Tori Peters' Detransition Baby, um, you know, there aren't a lot of examples of big publishing houses uh, publishing trans fiction before them, and those books just came out this year. So, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen a lot change, but um, I'm very grateful, certainly, in that light to be, uh, you know, to be a published trans fiction writer working today. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. What are some of your favorite books by trans writers? You know, that's a really good question. Um, uh, it's a well-known fact that uh, Imogen Binney's Nevada uh, was a novel that made sort of, sort of kind of like a, um, sort of an underground success in a certain uh, uh, sort of way among a certain, uh, uh, certain degree of, tr uh, um, of trans readers uh, some years ago when it was published in 2013. I would be among them, loved Nevada, um, I'm also a big fan of uh, Sybil Lamb's I've Got a Time Bomb, uh, Jia Ching, Wilson Yang's Small Beauty. Um, uh, I love Janet Mock's memoir, Redefining Realness. Um, like I said before, trans memoirs have sort of been a very um, uh, sort of specific and seamy genre. And I think Janet Mock just blew it up in the best way and, uh, and kind of redefined it, like as, as, as her title uh, uh, implies. Um, also a big fan of Joshua Jennifer Espinosa's poetry. Uh, she's got this book called, I think, There Will Be There Should Be Flowers. Really loved that one. Um, love Cat Fitzpatrick's Glamour Puss. Love Kokomo's Reacquainted with Life. Also both poetry books. Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, Kai Cheng Kai Cheng Tom's Fierce Femmes, Notorious Li Liars, a uh, great novel. Um, uh, no, I'm missing a few else, but, uh, th you know, there's some good ones to start with. There's just, um, and of course, uh, Summer Fun and Detransition Baby, as I uh, mentioned before, had a great novel. Oh, and I'll just end with Jackie S.'s Barrel, um, the novel that also just came out this year that is just one of the smartest and funniest, funniest fucking things I've read in a very, very long time. Um, yeah, I hope that's, uh, that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Now, would you say trans writers have a particular color that they are drawn to? You know, it's actually a really good question. Uh, of course, there are multitudes of colors that trans writers are, are drawn to, um, ju just like a lot of, you know, the, the wider uh, swath of humanity. Um, but certainly Kelly Green uh, is, uh, is well known for being um, a color, uh, color favored by, by trans writers. You see this, uh, it's, it's a continuing motif. Uh, green, of course, uh, connoting envy, um, and uh, you know, envy is a theme that uh, trans writers use, use quite a lot in their fiction. One would think that it might be envy um, of, say, cisgender people and uh, the degree to which they do or do not experience gender dysphoria, um, but I think it's actually sort of something a little more complicated than that. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Some people say that trans people are able to conjure the future. How do you think that affects trans writers?
You know, it's actually a really good question. Um, it's definitely a well-known fact that uh, when a trans writer publishes a work of fiction, um, something in that writer's life will come true. Um, the trick is it's sort of a, it's sort of a difficult power to um, control. So you don't really get to choose what part of the book is going to uh, going to come true. Um, uh, as a trans fiction writer, um, you know sometimes you might see. Uh, a lot of sad stuff in my books, and sometimes you might see, you know, some characters having moments of joy and happiness. Uh, that's me trying to kind of uh, outwit this naturally occurring algorithm, if you will, um, and, uh, you know, hoping that uh, some of the better things will come true in my own life. It hasn't happened yet, though, unfortunately. Um, uh, in a few weeks, my new book, A Dream of a Woman, is coming out, uh, and uh, perhaps it will have come out by the time you're watching this. Um, so hopefully, you know, um, uh, hopefully it'll turn out in my favor this time, you know, I'm hoping. Um, of course, I'm only realizing now that, um, not a lot of good things happen to the characters in this book, actually. Uh, yeah, I might have really screwed that one up. Um, they do have some really good sex in a, in a few scenes, so here's, uh, you know, here's hoping for that. Um, but I think it's a kind of, you know, it's similar to the sort of struggle that, that all trans writers go through, really, and I hope that maybe gives you a bit of a window into that. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Now, I've heard some trans writers say that squirrels are actually transsexual rats. Do you think that's true? Oh, man. Okay. Actually, that's a really, really good question. Um, it's a well-known fact that uh, squirrels are indeed considered uh, the transsexuals of the rat world. Now, you might actually say, perhaps, well, but squirrels aren't really rats at all, um, which is just kind of indicative of a transphobic level of thinking, in my opinion. Um, squirrels, for example, um, forage for human food often. They will disturb a human's gardens. Um, but of course, squirrels are also uh, wilier, smarter, um, and generally just cuter um, than rats. Um, so once you get your head around the fact that, you know, perhaps squirrels have more in common with rats than you might think of, um, then really personally, I think it's a, you know, I think it's a big step for equality overall. Um, and that's why you see so many squirrels appear uh, within the works of trans writers. I'm thinking of books like Sybil Lamb's I've Got a Time Squirrel, Imogen Binney's Squirrel Vada, uh, Janet Mock's Redefining Squirrelness, um, and Kai Cheng Tom's Fierce Squirrels and Notorious Liars. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, yeah, there's something to that. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. I understand trans writers are excellent at replacing light bulbs. Is that just a rumor? Or can you shed any light on that? You know, that's actually a really good question. Um, it is a well-known fact uh, that during the, uh, the 1993 uh, WPATH, that is the uh, World Professionals of Transgender Health um, Organization, um, there was the, a, a popular uh, light bulb joke um, that, they were, that was told to open the conference, uh, which is, how many trans people does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer was, uh, only one, but they have to wait in the dark for a year to make sure the light bulb really wants to change first. Uh, the joke didn't go over too well because it was uh, WPATH. So especially at the time, you know, there's more of a, of a gatekeeping um, ethos there um, when it came to prescribing things like hormonal treatment and letters for surgeries. Uh, hence the joke, have to wait in the dark for a year to really want to change. Now, however, um, that sort of little, little kernel of a moment grew, you see. Um, and of course, trans people being used to lots of change in their lives, whether it's self-directed or uh, whether it's forced upon them, by outside forces, you know, uh, there was this movement that just started growing, which meant that when you started going on hormone replacement therapy, you had to get really good at changing light bulbs. Um, and this is one of those subtle funny things in sort of micro communities where this just grew and grew and grew. And to this day, uh, when you go to say a uh, support group in a, um, uh, in, you know, uh, like trans support groups in uh, LGBTQ centers, for example, um, if it's your first time there, you have to change a light bulb. 
to uh, as a way of sort of being welcomed into the group, sort of, sort of like an icebreaker of sorts. Um, so yeah, there actually is, a, a, is, is truth to that rumor. Um, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Do you have any thoughts on the phenomenon of trans women enjoying pickles? Oh my god. You know, I wanted to sit for this hoping that this was going to be a respectful interview. If you can't hold it that, I'm just going to leave. No, please, Casey.